Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick, and Jeff Lasseter. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. Listen to us at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. If you could go to Apple Podcasts, though, and rate and review the show, give us a five-star review. We'll read it on the air. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash critics pod. And then we have a T public page over at I hate critics.net. It's up in the right hand corner, or you can search critics pod at T public.com. Sean, where can people get your movie reviews? You can find me at uh, geeks.media and horror.media, all part of the vocal uh, dot media family. And uh, also uh, the archive of my 2000 plus 20 years worth of reviews at uh, Sean at the movies dot blogspot dot com. And Jeff, we're sort of curious about uh, correcting me on a title that seeing if I liked it or not. You can just go find it there. And you can correct me to myself. He corrects himself often. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. Uh, Jeff, where can people find your artwork? Uh, Jeff Lasseter dot com. And if you're in Chicago on, uh, March 31st through April 2nd, I will be at Golden Con, the Golden Girls fan convention, selling my artwork there. Awesome. All right. I didn't watch it, but how were the Oscars? Uh, you know, I thought it was full on cringe for the most part. I mean, the winners were wonderful. Everything, everywhere, all at once winning is absolutely the right call. And every every one of the big winners that wasn't all – all Quiet on the Western Front, which we we all agree is not a good movie. Uh, everything else was the winners were fine. Jimmy Kimmel, I, I I never I've never really been a big fan. I've never really disliked the guy. I like some things about him, but boy, is he cringe watching the just the 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 attempts at jokes. I mean, it, it is absolute death when these guys walk out into the crowd. <laughs> it is truly just death. Just don't do it. I mean, at one point, Bob, he made it. He was talking to Malala. And he had, he just couldn't resist making a joke of her name and saying Malala Land. And I just, I cringed so hard. It hurt. It was painful. My eyes rolled. It hurt so much to, 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 to listen to him uh, do that joke. But really, just any joke that he did was kind of like that the whole night. But there are a lot of, there were a little frustrating things. Like when we were talking about the whale on the show we were talking about you know how cruel that movie is towards the towards the character Brendan Fraser plays but also now it's kind of it's also about how Darren Aronofsky and really Hollywood is just being openly cruel to overweight people like hey hey that that uh, issue that you have where you can't seem to keep off weight you know, that's just a costume to us <laughs> like screw you you know like there's a, at one point during when they won they won best makeup for that movie and they, and the announcer says, as the makeup people are walking to the stage, uh, turning Brendan Fraser into the whale, which pretty well confirms then that the, that the title is basically mocking him. It's not like as if the movie weren't cruel enough to him. Like the, even the title is just openly mocking the character. Uh, it, it's just it's it made me hate that movie even more. It, it's upsetting to have that be like an A24 thing. Because A twenty four is usually so, uh, so engaged and so so good at this, and to see them be this bad at this was really that uh, really sucked. Um, I was really annoyed by that, uh, but overall, like you know, the speeches were emotional and and well done. Uh, like I said, everything everywhere all at once won everything, so uh, that that certainly made made it uh, a worthwhile show. At least they got the movie right. Yeah, I've been reading nothing. I mean, Jeff mentioned it last night in our group chat, but I just log on. And it's just like everything's anti Jamie Lee Curtis all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, it was. I here's the deal: everybody that was nominated in that category could have mm-hmm. won. Yeah, um, it was. People were <laughs> complaining that Jamie Lee Curtis got it for her whole career. And out of one side of their mouth and then the other side of their mouth, they were saying that Angela Bassett deserved it because she didn't get it for what's love got to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't have it both ways. You know, it's 
we all know it's a popularity contest. We all know that Jamie Lee Curtis is the biggest hype woman you will ever get for your movie. If you hire her, you barely have to do any marketing because she will go all over social media and talk about whatever movie she's in, be it Halloween ends or everywhere, everything everywhere all at once. She is going to talk up the shit out of your movie. Um, I, I love Jamie Lee Curtis. I was actually pulling for Stephanie Hsu because I thought her, her role was so, you know, much more involved. Am I mad though? Absolutely not. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. I think she, she deserves an Oscar just for being in Halloween ends and dealing with Tim Allen and you know, all that. But I, (laughs) it was very, very pointedly, hating on Jamie Lee Curtis on Twitter last night because Angela Bassett didn't win. And without getting into the whole race thing about it, because there was a lot of that, you know, of course this white woman won. I heard, I read that a hundred times and I was just like, you know what? It's Angela Bassett is a great actress and she did a lot of, you know, outsized yelling, but she was in a Marvel movie and they don't really Mm -hmm. care about Marvel movies. The Academy, you know, she got, she got a nomination, which if you're in a Marvel movie to me, that's a win right there (laughs) because people don't go to Marvel movies looking for high art generally. Yeah. Um, I think if I may like the, the, some of it was not, I I think, I think a lot of it may not have been aimed directly at Jamie Lee Curtis. A lot of it was aimed at the optics of the Oscars, which is like in a category filled with uh, people of color. They picked the one white woman, you know, and I know it's it's and again, we're going to I know the argument is we're supposed to pick the best performance or the performance that we like the most. And that's what people are doing. Uh, at the same time, it's the Oscars. The Oscars has never picked the best performance <laughs> ever, really. They got it right this year only because I really like this movie. Uh, and, but every other year, we're always saying that, they, that they're always picking, picking the wrong thing. And it does, you know, optically, it, it does magnify you know, decades upon decades of Oscar history. Well, no, I get it, but at the same time, you don't want them just picking a character because of their race either. No, of course not. And they've that's done what, that yeah. too. <laughs> And that's what's kind of, (laughs) you know, you don't want, that's just, I don't know. They just, the Oscars are so, just the whole idea of them makes me. Well, it's it's a popularity contest. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you're voting for your friends because, and your, your peers, because you vote for the category that you are in generally. And I, I just think that once you kind of grow out of the whole, oh, you know what, it's, It's so much more money and prestige and blah, blah, blah. I mean, come on. Roberto Benigni won an Oscar. Come on. (laughs) You know, it's like (laughs) nobody. When's the last time anybody heard him, heard of him? It doesn't matter. Ultimately, Um, I heard a lot of, you know, I I have another group chat in Twitter, a, a scream centric one. And, you know, there was a lot of talk in that chat about, you know, well, I love Jamie Lee Curtis, but she shouldn't have gotten it. And here's why blank should have gotten it. And it was never really about the performance. It was more about the optics. And yeah. I, I'm all about, I like, I love inclusion. I love, you know, seeing different people, but, and I think what's going to have to happen is the old white cisgendered straight actors and producers and directors are all going to have to start dying off um speaking of that in memoriam needed to be about three minutes longer um (laughs) but they're gonna you know they're gonna it's gonna have to just get more people of color and other life experiences in the academy before it's gonna change that's just that's just the facts i mean it's not uh, otherwise it does look like uh, you know the ham-fisted way the academy sometimes tries to be inclusive right you know, I mean, and that was, there was a few moments last night where I was just like, yikes. Um, and if they want to be more exclu- inclusive, Jimmy Kimmel could have laid off the Will Smith jokes. Yeah, no bit. kidding. No um, kidding. I do not condone what Will Smith did. I think he was an asshole for doing it. I think that, you know, but he still won an Oscar. And, you know, he ha- it hasn't really hurt his career, I don't think, at this point, because there's so much apologizing for him. 
Um, well, Chris Rock did but, him a favor by by turning into a complete asshole, so that that helps him a little bit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. The, just, those I, those I, jokes again, the the cringe factor again coming off of. I know I'm using that word a lot and misusing it, but honestly, like I just, I, it's the only way I can describe how how I tensed up at every terrible joke, and they were just they were all terrible, and I just I really wish there was a way to to reinvent doing the Oscars to reinvent a, you know, a way to have people introduce these things and and a way to do funny jokes. But apparently we're just going to keep hiring the same, you know, five people who are in our who are our age, who, you know, making the same jokes they've made for the past 30 years. I'll tell you what, it's missing my friend Bruce Valanche. Because <laughs> he was at least funny. Yeah, yeah I. Go back yeah. to the memor- back to the in memoriam though, Jeff. I know you're upset that they didn't put Robert Blake on it, but honestly, the optics <laughs> were bad on that. Uh, one of the best things was I went to my sister's to watch it, and she goes, "Who's Robert Blake?" And I was like, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> no, the weird one. The, the weird one. Like there were a couple that I understood. Like they're problematic people who maybe they don't want to include, but like Paul Servino. Why leave Paul Servino off? Paul Servino is, he was in Goodfellas. I mean, there's nothing he that I'm aware cruising. of. Nothing I'm aware of that was really deeply problematic. Like Tom Sizemore, I get. Like there's a lot of weird allegations about Tom Sizemore out there that you don't want to touch. I get that. Uh, but like Paul Servino, what the hell? <laughs> I Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I was like very... I, all I cared about, I, I honestly, is that Angela Lansbury was on it because, you know, mm-hmm. I am a big stan. Um, I, but yeah, I, I was like, where is Paul Sorvino? What, did he? And, th- and then I thought it was like, well, did he die um, before? And then I was like, no, he definitely should have been included. And I think for something like that, you don't want to have. Um, you don't want to have to go to a website. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I saw that at the end and I was just like, Oh, come on. You know, but like if you were in an Oscar nominated movie, like Charlie Dean from triangle of sadness, why wasn't she there? That was another weird one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, did. you're literally in a best picture nominated movie and they don't even bother mentioning. Yeah. So. Strange, but the whole thing, yeah, the whole thing is just, a lot of bad, a lot of bad, a lot of good for the winners. I'm happy with the winners. I, like I said, I wish we could just figure out a way to just do, just do the winners and not even have a monologue and that kind of garbage. I think they did that a couple of years ago and it wasn't good and they got spooked and they went back to the old model. I, I think the old model is dead. Uh, I think there has to be a way to do it. There has to be a better way than this to do it. That's for sure. Well, I mean, they, they, tried it without a host and that didn't really work um i don't know i just i don't know how you do it unless you about, get just some writers who are super sharp and you don't how about hiring this. people in their 20s how about that let's yeah. get some let's get some people who are actually like a, a you know kind of hip to the world right now because like as we saw with the with with anything that was won by all quiet on the Western front, we've still got 90 year olds who are operating the Academy apparently. Uh, Uh, Yeah. (laughs) But you know what? You don't have, this is not so our like Gen X and younger don't revere the Oscars as much as people like boomers and things do. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they, they're people that tend to might be the attitude they need. (laughs) Well, that's what I'm saying is you know get people who are younger to write it who don't think that it's like some formal affair make it more like the golden globes Ugh. you know what i mean as i i'm talking as far as like being a little looser you, and, yeah not not like abusing people and being super racist no no that's <laughs> I'm the saying, oscars are already racist enough on its own that <laughs> and let yeah let it be looser though let it be a little more you know hip and let mm-hmm. the people kind of talk themselves into a corner um, instead yeah. of thinking, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I must speak with, you know, I must speak like this during the Oscars because it is the most important night of the year. No, it's, you know, just 
say fuck once in a while. <laughs> well, one final note, just uh, the the there's one item from the uh, free show that went viral is Hugh Grant having a very awkward uh, interview on the red carpet. A lot of people are like, well, he was making a very funny joke about uh, a Vanity Fair and the young woman who di- didn't wasn't aware of the book Vanity Fair didn't get the joke and people were saying she's dumb and I think he was an asshole. I think he went I think oh. he didn't want to be there. I think he was just being a total prick and and you can if you want to side with him and pretend that you're just super smart like you got that joke too. Yeah, you know, you're just you're lying to yourself. You didn't get the joke either. Yeah. <laughs> like most ninety percent of the audience did not get that joke, and it doesn't make you smart if you did. Uh, you know, she, she wasn't asking great questions. She she asked him what it was like to be in Glass Onion, and he's like, "I was only there for two seconds." And like, yeah, he was. But it's like that's the reason why you're there, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, know, I mean, you're there I... because of the movie. So don't be a complete asshole about it. You know. Yeah, I just he I don't I don't like Hugh Grant generally. Um so I don't like I wouldn't have interviewed him. I wouldn't have even <laughs> Yeah. I would have just been like, oh it's Hugh Grant, never mind. All right, that's all. Nothing yeah. more to talk about with that garbage. But Jamie Lee Curtis shouting out genre movies, yes. <laughs> okay. I'm done. But that's why I don't watch it anymore. And quite frankly, <laughs> twenty year olds take it over, I don't watch it either. <laughs> I don't like anything they do. I don't like anything. All right. Uh sixty five we'll start there. Sixty five stars uh, Adam Driver as Captain Mills. He lives on s- some planet far off in the distance, and he's taking a job that's going to have him fly a cargo plane full of people in cryopods to somewhere else in the universe. Uh, he's doing this because he needs the money. His daughter is uh, dying of some unspecified disease, and he needs to get money. And he's been promised like three times his usual pay if he can uh, do this one run, and that might be enough to save his daughter, uh, played by Chloe Coleman, who's a wonderful young actress. Uh, she's not in the movie nearly enough, unfortunately. Uh, the, once we take off, we're, we're on our way. The uh, meteor shower takes out his ship and takes him down to the ground, and they, they crash, and uh, he's got to survive a bunch of dinosaurs because apparently he's on Earth 65 million years ago, and why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he's he's the most american alien you've ever seen in your life and uh i don't know why i don't i don't know i don't want to mock it i i i think some of it is very it's unfortunately this is going to come off very condescending and kind of mean but it's incredibly competent it's an incredibly competent action movie but is it is it particularly entertaining is it particularly interesting or different not really uh it doesn't really have any sense of humor whatsoever uh, even though you've got Adam Driver fighting dinosaurs, you might think that might be fun, but nobody seems to be having any fun in the movie. I didn't have really any fun. The movie is grim and dark, and the monsters aren't particularly memorable. I I didn't hate it. I just I'm I'm very ambivalent about it. I just it, it didn't engage me. Didn't win me over. And uh, and I usually like really like Adam Driver, and I think I think Beck and Woods are good. I liked Haunt. I thought Haunt was a good horror mm-hmm. movie. Uh, and they, their writing on, on A Quiet Place was terrific. I think that they're trying to recapture some of that Quiet Place energy with something very mainstream. And I think I think there's a lot of compromises in going as mainstream as they did here. And actually, Haunt is on Hulu, and you can watch it for free if, if you should. It's great. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, I actually... I, I saw it... I, I, I liked it. It was not what I thought it was going to be going in. I thought, um, and this, and the, my one, my one thing that I think would have made it a little better even was if it had been what I thought it was, which was that Adam driver is from earth and he act, he somehow goes through a wormhole or something and ends up in the past, like, like a, uh, planet of the apes kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he realizes that halfway, you know, and I was taken out of it a little bit just by the, you know, the earth slang and, you know, he, he's kilometers and all that. That took me out a little bit. And that's why I was like, oh, you know what? That would have all made sense if he had just like accidentally 
gotten in a wormhole and then come out, you know, just before the big. Yeah, uh, I agree completely. Um, but I, you know, I was engaged the whole time. I was, I was into the dinosaurs, which I love dinosaurs. So that was for me, that was a big part of it that I loved. Um, you're right. Uh, both of the younger actresses were great. I, I did not get that she had actually died. I thought that was just him having a nightmare mm-hmm. that his, his daughter had actually died and he had just missed it. Um, I thought that was just a nightmare he was having and he had to get back to try to say, you know, to try to be there with her. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what the stakes are when you see that ass, that big ass asteroid coming towards earth, you're like, Oh, this is an extinction event. Okay. Um, and I, I, I kind of, I kind of thought that they were going to get stuck there, and then you know, I don't know. Somehow their DNA would populate the Earth or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, unfortunately, I mean, really, that would really, be that would be far well, more yeah. interesting than anything they came up with. Apparently, because uh, like this is mostly just a straight, it's a straight action movie, and as a straight action movie, like I said, it's incredibly competent. Um, it has a ticking clock via the meteors. It's got all the elements you recognize of an action movie, and it's got a movie star, which are, are good things, but there's just nothing there to elevate it, in my opinion. Just It doesn't quite... Like, Adam Driver is, is very committed, very passionate, but he's not doing anything particularly interesting beyond existing. Um, you know, he doesn't have any quirks. He's not having any fun. Uh, uh, and and the sequences of action where he has to fight a dinosaur aren't particularly interesting. You know, he, his, he's got this electronic laser gun, whatever thing that that can shoot dinosaurs, and it uh, and it never runs out of ammo. Uh, it's it's quite <laughs> quite an effective thing to have a, a weapon that never runs am- out of ammunition. Makes it very convenient and creates no tension whatsoever. Uh, he's got the gadget. His gadgets always work, aside from the one that he needs to talk to the girl, and that that's the one that doesn't work. You know, I never thought I would ever need to see a dinosaur scalded by a geyser, but God, am I glad I did. That was so Strong cool. visual. Strong visual. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that was Strong. great. Yeah, that was gross. Uh, I dig like... that. I wish, <laughs> I wish there had been more of that energy in the movie, but unfortunately it's not. From someone who didn't see it in the outside looking in, it just looks like a too big of a budget movie for that idea. I don't know. Like I just don't know how it's successful, but maybe it is. Hopefully it is. Uh, you don't. You always like to see people do well, but I definitely left the trailer wondering why would you make this and why, what are you doing, Adam Driver? But then and what are you doing, studio releasing it this weekend? right <laughs> yeah i mean come on the elephant in the room they buried it i think yeah they buried it i don't know why they buried it but they buried it uh you know it's because it's not a bad enough movie to deserve to be buried and i've never understood the concept of burying something you spent this much money on that truly is just bizarre to me but like you had to know that it was going to fail up against what it's up against i mean the buzz was very clear everybody knew this was coming you could put this movie out two weeks ago or or three weeks from now and it would have had a window where it could be far more successful i it's a bizarre choice well and they spent money money on against champions right but they spent money i mean it was before like every movie i've seen for the past month or two so they're clearly Mm -hmm. spending money commercial yeah right they had a super bowl commercial yeah they it it, just odd just odd financial decisions (laughs) Were they trying to like? Were they trying to kick scream? Like trying to? Or did they? I don't know. I don't. I don't get it. I don't it's get. Not it. It's not opposite enough choice. of scream to be. Yeah, exactly. It's not counter programming. Yeah, because it also like kind of banks on some horror elements. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's it's not like like Champions is a is counter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, I mean, this was just a little too close. Like if it had been. Last weekend, or you know, in a couple of weeks after Shazam, who knows? Is Champions any good? Champions is actually pretty good. Yes, uh, it's uh, the, one of the good Farrelly brother. 
uh, <laughs> the, the one that didn't make Green Book, uh, <laughs> directing a, a sports movie set against the the backdrop of the Special Olympics, uh, a a D League uh, or Z League or Y League, uh, just a lower level NBA coach on uh, one of the minor league coaches uh he gets himself in trouble he wants to be the head coach he keeps getting in trouble with his coach ernie hudson until he pushes him uh during a game and gets himself fired uh he also then drives drunk and run, dr- runs into a cop car and uh he ends up getting assigned to be this coach for this uh special olympics basketball team in des moines iowa and the team is wonderful. They're just this wonderful, quirky, funny group of people who just want to get together and play basketball. They just enjoy they just enjoy playing basketball together. They're friends. They've been friends for a long time. And they're just they're a wonderful group with each with just their own little individual characteristic that sets them apart and makes them fun and fun to watch. Uh then there's Caitlin Olson coming into this movie. She is phenomenal. She just is totally great. She and uh, Woody, Woody Harrelson together are just wonderful. They they subvert your expectations because they put them together before the the whole plot kicks in. The first thing you see is them hooking up off of like a Tinder, and then she comes back because she's the the sister of one of the guys on the basketball team, and it's. It's a nice subversion to have them know each other before they come together, and 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 she's especially she's just she's bringing that Caitlin Olson uh, always sunny in Philadelphia energy to it. That's a, that's a little bit different. Uh, I really enjoyed her. I really enjoyed the choices they made with her. But they really make a lot of fun choices throughout this movie. Uh, I I really enjoyed it. Uh, Mordecai. I Mordecai. Okay. Because this is an because this is an iPhone commercial starring J- Judd Hirsch that happens to be a ninety minute movie, made by a guy who makes cigars for a living. So Sean Astin's character also makes cigars. I uh, so this is just a dilettante making a movie that he got like I don't know if he got Apple to pay him to make this. I don't know. The idea here is that uh, Sean Astin is upset that his dad Judd Hirsch. Uh, is never available because he's using a very, very old phone, so he wants to get him an iPhone, and when he does, this iPhone opens up a whole new life for him. He meets a, a new new friends at the iPhone store who teach him how to use his iPhone, and uh, he's doing art on his iPhone and lear- learning new things and finding pictures of his parents from the Holocaust on his iPhone, and it's just about an iPhone. And I, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to watch this movie. It's so bad, and it's got... It's got Carol Kane as his wife, which I didn't. You know, what a, a nice bit of irony! We're going to watch a good Carol Kane movie later on. Which thank God for that. Uh, she's she's got dementia in this movie, so you've got the Holocaust, you've got dementia, and then it's this light comedy that's happening throughout the movie about this old man and his iPhone. Oh, isn't he funny? He's got his iPhone and he's got Beats by Dre on, but he's listening to old people music. Oh my God, it's awful! Just absolutely awful. If Judd Hirsch had actually been like a real contender to win the Oscar, this would have been like his, uh, <laughs> like his Eddie Murphy moment with Dream Girls. You know, when Norbit came out. This is his Norbit. I'm Mordecai and Norbit, b- brothers in arms. All right, and then there's Scream Six. Yeah, Scream 6, uh, the uh, same directors as Scream 5, uh, bringing back much of that cast, aside from the only one who mattered, Nev Campbell, who's not back. Uh, (laughs) The story has been moved to New York this time. Uh, The point here is to get revenge on on the girls who killed Richie from the other movie. I think his name is Richie. I don't care. Uh, (laughs) It is Richie, not Randy. I I don't care. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the point is, is that this is all Gail Weathers fault for some reason uh, she she decided after the end of the last movie in Scream 5 she decided she had told, she said I'm not going to write a book about this we'll just let these two people who killed Amber and, Amber and Richie who killed everybody in Scream 5 we're just going to let them not have the fame that they want and not continue this story and then of course for the movie to continue in Scream 6, Gail has to go back on her word and not be Gail Weathers and just be a terrible person and give up all the growth that she's had over five movies in order to just be uh, a, a celebrity-chasing jerk uh, who gets punched because that's what happened to her in the first movie. Uh, I really hated that. I really hated what they did. They did Gail so bad in this movie. I don't know why they decided to have 
just give away everything that was great about what Courtney Cox had been building over five movies. Uh, I just saw Scream 5, by the way, just just last week, right before I saw Scream 6, the same day I saw him. And I really liked Scream 5. Like, I watched that movie and got choked up a couple of times watching Courtney Cox and Nev Campbell interact because I've, I've enjoyed them, you know, the, the growth that they've had as characters from the beginning of the franchise into this one and taking all that emotion in and then Dewey and all that stuff coming together. I love that. The character growth has been wonderful. And then this movie goes, fuck you. No kid, no Nev Campbell. And we're going to blame everything on Gail. It's all her fault that this plot is happening. Because without her, without her doing that, basically this plot can't happen <laughs> for the most part. But on top of that, they've got to give up the character growth that the Carpenter sisters had in the last movie. Ms. Melissa Barrera and uh, Jenna Ortega, their, their characters can't have to give up the growth that they had. So all the lessons that they learned they may have learned or should have learned in Scream 5, they've got to give up because they immediately invited a stranger to come live with them and they immediately didn't suspect a guy, you know, moving in with their their friend uh, Mason Gooding's character as a newcomer, and they just invite him into their group. And, of course, who guess who they are? <laughs> like, it's so obvious and so dumb, and I hate this movie now. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> or do you want <laughs> Well, you can, yes, you can go first and then I'll tell Sean why he's wrong. <laughs> I watched, it was terrible. I watched all six of them this weekend and I, yeah. I'd only been through three and I disagree with you on five. I think that was kind of a, my, maybe the worst one. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I thought, uh, anyway, we'll talk, we're talking about six. I actually was enjoying six for a while. I liked the idea of, uh, the main character, Samantha, dealing with the fact that she's the son, the daughter of Billy. Uh, I just they just kept making missteps with, you know, getting you to the end. Uh, I thought the killings were more brutal. I thought everything about it was great up until you know where it's going to go. They try to trick you and and almost to the point of cheating. And even then, it still wasn't shocking. Uh, I don't know. It was weird. It was just kind of a weird... Part of me has to accept that that's what this movie is. That's what the series is. And because I don't really like it outside of the first one, in hindsight, going back and watching all of them. But I get why they're confident and why they're, people like them. Uh, but at the same time, it's like if I'm going to have that opinion of of this and lower the bar for scream. Why am I not doing that for Adam Sandler? Who's even lowering it lower than they are, but at least that's his, you know, that's what he's going for. Why, you know, I'm not willing to give him that leeway. Why am I giving scream that leeway? So uh, I was enjoying it here and there, but it really wasn't held together by a very strong plot. That said, Scream 3, I think you're way too hard on. I think they knew that was stupid, and everybody was in on it, and it actually kind of flowed. I don't know. It, some of these other movies it was, don't it was realize more of a comedy. Stupid. Yeah, some of these other movies, they they keep, they work in the comedy, but it's not consistent with the, the rest of the movie. But Scream 3 was pretty consistent beginning to end. Now I get why that would take you out of it, but I, I think they knew it. Everybody seemed to know what movie they were making. Yeah. Well, and if you're putting Parker Posey in a movie playing, I mean, I I watched all the movies before the new one came out and I just I justice for Jennifer Jolie because her, the interplay between her and Courtney Cox in every scene they were in together and then with add in Carrie Fisher <laughs> and I mean that elevates it above, you know, so much higher than 5 for me. I agree. I, I even at five, I just kind of felt like Nev Campbell and Courtney Cox didn't want to be there. Like it's some of their scenes just kind of seem like not again, kind of, you know, almost that level of yeah. acting. Uh, but anyway, Jeff, go ahead. Well, I mean, we all know that Nev Campbell didn't come back because they didn't want to pay her to do what would have been a cameo. And I'm sure it would have been something like, Randy and Scream 3 where it was just you know over FaceTime or something and she deserves more than that she deserves to be paid because she's the one who shepherded this franchise from the very first one all the way to the last one uh, 
That being said, I did not miss her in this movie the way I thought I would. I went into it, you know, going, oh, God, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. And it wasn't the same, but it was different. And it would have seemed like they were shoehorning her in more so than even the last one. Um, I was not a big, big fan of the last one. I had to go see it twice uh, to make sure that I even liked it. You know, and I, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. And then I went and saw it again, and I did not like Amber. I didn't care about Richie. Um, I, you know, it was each screen movie has its own. This is what it's about, you know, about the movies, about horror movies, whatever, you know, from a, just a parody of 80 slashers and then, you know, the media and college and then Hollywood and the meta of it all, you know, from Sydney, like running around in the, inside her own bedroom and then, going into another room and there's she's in Stu's house. It's like that whole meta Hollywood thing. And then scream four was about a reboot. Scream five was kind of a remake. And then scream six is remaking the sequel. So I, I, what I didn't like about five though, is that it was too much of a remake and they were just aping Billy and Stu. Amber was obviously Stu because she was the crazy one and you always right. have to have a, a crazy one. And that's what, that's what like, if it had been a little more subtle in five and in six with Dermot Mulroney, all of a sudden he's crazy. And he's like, <laughs> from part two. Um, <laughs> now that being said, okay. I did not like Melissa Barrera in the, in the last one. I'm not a, I wasn't a big fan of the Billy stuff. Uh, you know, like making it line up because okay, she'd have to be 25, but she looks more like she's 19, mm -hmm. all that. Um, the horrible, horrible makeup and de-aging on um, what's it, Skeet Ulrich in the last <laughs> one. It was just it took me out of it every time he was on screen. If it's just been his voice, that would have been fine with me. Um, I, I really I I didn't. Most of the cast last time I was not a fan of, with the exception, of course, of Jenna Ortega, who is a goddamn star and should be in everything. Um, you put put Jenna Ortega and Mia Goth in another movie together, please. Just please <laughs> yeah. do it. I just I worry oh, that she's to get too famous. That's what I'm afraid of because yeah. she won't do Mia Goth movies. <laughs> <laughs> but watching five a couple hours, you know. I started a couple hours before I went and took my nieces to six and I was like, okay, it's not so bad, but watching six, I was like, Oh, they've gotten so much better. You know, Melissa Barrara wasn't as bad as I remembered her in five in six. And she, you know, she, she seemed to be like kind of embracing her darkness a little bit, as opposed to just going crazy at the end, like she did in five. Um, and a lot of it was about, you know, the inability to let go. And Jenna Ortega said that, you know, so I just wish you'd let me go. And then at the end, that's the big plot point. And that's where she, you know, um, Melissa has to, Sam, I'll just start, try to, I'll try to call them by their character names, but I'm it's so fine. bad at that. It's fine. Um, yeah. Sam realizes that the only way she can survive is to let Tara go. And I, I do have a problem with the fact that they're never going to kill anybody off. Yeah, no uh, kidding. <laughs> I got to I got to jump on it. I got to jump in on that. That was ridiculous. Knives apparently just don't work in this universe. Apparently, nobody has vital organs and knives just no longer work. And I know I'm supposed to suspend disbelief on that and I have. For 5 movies, I have suspended disbeliefs about the effectiveness of knives, but this movie didn't give me anything more interesting to focus on to make me want to suspend my disbelief. And then when it gets to what happens to Mason Gooding's character, this man is, a, he doesn't have, he's just, he's putty. He's putty man. He grows back to life. He, he's like, he has no bones. He has no blood. He has no, no, no muscle, no vital organs. He's just a blood bag well, <laughs> that I, can uh... get popped in certain places and then re reform apparently like he's the fucking Terminator. Because that was the dumbest scene in any Scream movie. Yeah, I'd argue these are the most, some of the most brutal, you know, quote unquote murders that weren't murders. 
<laughs> uh, I mean, it turned yeah. into Avengers Age of Ultron. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> you know what? He should have died because he was the one who kept saying core four, core four. He should have died to like make that mean something. You know, they killed Randy in Scream 2. And that meant something because everybody identified with Randy. And Randy was like the touchstone for the audience. And, you know, give it give him give it some stakes. As much as it was um, about know, I, stakes with Randy, they also just really hated being around Jamie Kennedy, so they had to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean. It's like Randy was a beloved character from the first one, yeah, yeah. and nobody that came back from the first one of this what's going to be a trilogy died, and they should have. It should have been either. It should have been one of the twins. Well, especially how and, d- their dumb decisions that they made. I mean, <laughs> the idiotic, moronic decisions they kept making. Yeah, they should be dead. Absolutely. You know, I and I love Jasmine Savoy Brown, but I, I really thought she was going to get it when she got stabbed on the train, and I, I just. I liked this better than the last one, although I do see the problems with it. Right. Uh, my, my biggest problem is that there were no stakes. Everybody lives who came back from one of the other ones. Uh, now, if they had killed Gale, I would have I would have been really pissed. Um, I That's think a, they should again. Ki- there again, I got another issue. Is like Gale has been through this so many times. For her to be as unprepared as she is in that moment for it to be attacked, I just didn't just ring completely false to me. She would have had she would have been a little bit more ready than she was. She'd be she's she's aware of that there that there's a ghost face again. She's been attacked so many times, and yet her house is so easy to get inside of. Her apartment is so easy to get inside of. Like I just didn't buy that. I didn't buy that she wouldn't have something prepared in case this happened. That that and it just goes again the growth that Courtney Cox has built into this character over time. That really, that that and the book, it just totally it took me out of the movie. It totally ruined it for me. I don't think she would have wrote the book. I think you have to get that get to there get to that point to get your story going. I know you need that information out there to get the story. It shouldn't have been Gail to do it. They shouldn't have sacrificed her character growth to make that happen. Well, and they spent so much I'll, time. Oh, go ahead. I'll. Uh, I was just gonna say, Gail to me would have she ultimately is an opportunist and she even she you know like that was the whole thing that broke her and dewey up is she got this great opportunity and she took it and he couldn't deal with it and she couldn't not deal with it so of course her her opportunism is what broke it broke them up and it's just to me it was just kind of reverting to form yes she learned some stuff but she would use that she would use the fact that somebody else was writing a book to justify her doing it so that she could say she got the true story out there even though you know from the sounds of it she didn't um so that didn't that didn't bug me what bugged me about the whole gail thing was the fact that yeah she didn't just leave town she had to be in on the media circus um i you know she should have gotten into that room and not shot through the door and you know like it should have been a panic room and then they come back and one of the girls gets attacked or something like that you know it was yeah little i mean it's like the the, the 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 little details that they just don't get right uh yeah i i but think I really, I really thought gail was gonna die i really did think she was gonna they were gonna kill her and i was i really was on the edge of my seat for that mm-hmm if you were going to do ahead, it, you bro. should have all the way gone with it. But I guess what I did miss Sydney a little more than you did, Jeff, just because they spent so much time talking about legacy characters. And it's like, if that's going to be a big part of your story, the main legacy character should be there uh, in a bigger role, too, than just a cameo. But oh, yeah, I just yeah, wish I had left that part out or left that whole legacy stuff out of it or at least dumbed it down a little bit. Another thing that bug I almost thought they were going to go supernatural, like Michael Myers in the most recent Halloweens. Uh, with, I mean, please, Ghostface. at this point. Well, <laughs> like, please. I mean, the amount of head injuries that these people suffer while wearing while wearing a rubber mask and well, they bounce back from, well, not please make it supernatural. But <laughs> like, even, the, like I've been saying, I, I thought these are the most brutal, you know, attacks 
And then you found out there were these two wimps. You know, it didn't even add up to... Because, you know, the cop was around them most of the time, so he wasn't the one making yeah, a lot of exactly. things. Yeah, exactly, yes. So Great you got point. these two little tiny teenagers or 20-somethings acting like they're seven feet tall just destroying people. It just... Yeah, like like Gail's boyfriend. Who who killed Gail's boyfriend? The, this big buff dude is getting taken down by what? A little teenage girl? Right. I mean, I can suspend my disbelief. I'm I will happily suspend my disbelief if you give me a better movie with better suspense, better characters, better dialogue. I'll happily suspend my disbelief. I couldn't. I gave up on suspending my disbelief in this movie because the none of it was interesting enough to make me want to invest. And then, and then on top of that, like I said, the head injuries, the the malfunctioning knives, <laughs> knives, <laughs> knives just don't work in this universe anymore. <laughs> like it's just it's garbage to me. Well, then Hayden Panettiere, oh, I, she was awful. I thought in this. Oh, absolutely. A- Amen. I completely agree. And uh, again, if they could have nailed the. Not even the little details, the big details. They missed some big details. I think I could. There was I, I was enjoying parts of this movie because I think Jeff's right. That core four, they were. I, I thought all four characters were great, but everything around it was weak, and uh, they just couldn't pull it off. And possibly the lamest of all the endings was this one, I think, mm-hmm. or maybe the fifth one because it was so like the first. Uh, I don't know. I just. It is what it is. I get why people like it, but I just feel like they're not trying as hard as they did. But that's well, just me. Now, I'm a huge Scream fan. I love it. I, you know, I'm working on a new Scream piece right now. Uh, however, how many times can this keep happening? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Before they take the costume off the market, before um, they quit making movies about it. Yeah, you know, stop making stab movies. Just stop writing books about it. Let let them die in anonymity like Gail said she was going to let them do last time. Um, I I really... I didn't miss Sydney in this particular story. Uh, I think overall, though, if they're going to do a last, a quote-unquote last one, because Scream 7 has already been greenlit. Uh, the <laughs> only way, in my opinion, to do it is... You know, just to have have one last fling where they all die or something. I mean, I, I don't want to. I I want. I liked the line about Sydney having her happy ending with Kincaid from the third movie. Um, but uh, you know, how much different would it have been if, had, say, you know, these were Sydney's kids? If she if she had older kids with him, you know, if they had started like procreating right after the events of Scream 3 instead of apparently 15 to 20 years later, you know, how that would give you more stakes. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I struggle with, you know, this movie series keep going on because there is no supernatural element to it. Um, I, I called Dermot Mulroney as a killer or, you know, I guess just being involved when he said, both my kids are dead. And I was like, wait, his son. And then I'm like, Oh, he's Richie's dad. <laughs> he's, he's the killer. I knew it like halfway, halfway, not even halfway through the movie. I was like, mm-hmm. it's him. And there's, you know, there's obviously another killer, at least one killer. Um, I, I do think though, that instead of, the revenge thing that they keep doing or the, you know, the, um, the little meta stuff, they're, they're going to have to do something different or it's just, it's just more of the same. And they started, I thought it would scream four. they kind of started to refresh it a little bit and like, mm-hmm. Oh, we're, this is the remake. And like Nev Campbell said in that movie, the first rule of remakes is don't fuck with the original. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, if that had been the last of the movies, it would have been a perfect capper. Yeah. But if they're going to make more, they've got to do something to to put the, you know, put the end on it. And if Sydney doesn't come back, 
I, I'm fine with that because I wanted her to have a happy ending. I think we're all pulling for Sydney throughout all the movies. Absolutely. Uh, you know, she's she is the one that we're pulling for. And I think that um, I didn't I I was I was spoiled before I saw the movie by somebody on Instagram posting that uh, Kirby was an FBI agent. I was like, I I Kirby was my favorite character from four. And I just don't see her as <laughs> as law enforcement um i that was what that kind of took me out but she was you know i kind of feel like she was wasted in that where she, you know are she good or bad and every time dermot Mulroney's character said something about her i was like well he's obviously lying because he's obviously the killer hmm. yeah. so, acting like a scooby-doo villain the whole time <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, to me, either Sydney and Samantha <laughs> team up and they become Ghostface in the next one, or what you could have done from the beginning is just go elsewhere, and it's a completely random story that has nothing to do with anybody else because that makes more sense with the Ghostface idea than f- trying to tie it back to the first one or the or any of these family people. I it just you could go on forever if you did that because then, yeah. then Ghostface makes sense. You know, throw the movies out, throw the books out, and it's just a random copycat thing that you could do over and over again. And mm-hmm. it can almost be its own story. You, you could just take a random great script and then throw a scream twist on it. it no, would, don't, no, you know why? You know why you can't do that? Because that's how we got 11 Hellraiser movies. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you could. Literally. You, but you could get yeah. 11 scream movies if you did that instead of seven. <laughs> but I, I mean, yes, they're gonna have to tie in the core four because none of them fucking died. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, quite honestly, I would like uh, to see Sam die. On the bright That's, side, I mean, they're never none of them are ever going to die because they have no internal organs. So I mean, they've got no true. vital organs. They there's nothing to stab. Uh, <laughs> so I think the next dream movie needs to be a sniper who shoots people in the head. Oh, I That's think, the only one well, to kill somebody in this universe. A sniper and a ghost face mask. <laughs> a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the screen fans and discourse that I saw leading up to the movie after the trailer was Ghostface doesn't use a shotgun, and I was like, Ghostface is you know like out of out of the costume has used a gun before, uh, you know Billy shot Gale in the first movie and right. it's it's it was more brutal that way I thought and you know if he's going to get a hold of a gun. Why not? Why not be a you know a shotgun killer or something like that? Ghostface mm-hmm. with a shotgun, starring Rutger Hauer. Um, <laughs> I know much they, better movie. I know what they could do. <laughs> In the next one, everybody finds out they actually have superpowers. That's why they haven't died. <laughs> <laughs> Make it supernatural. Yes, exactly. But now the good guys have <laughs> supernatural powers, and it's not even fun anymore. <laughs> it's just painful when they get stabbed, Terrific. but they live. <laughs> I love it, but I would I would love to see Sam die because if she's our focus character, then that stakes. And then that way you, know? you don't have to have Sydney die if you because Sam's the new Sydney in a way. So you know she's supposed to be well, right? But yeah. she's also the new Billy too. So yeah, I I don't mind the I, the struggle with her dealing with that. I think there's stuff they could do with there. Always can, uh, but I don't know. I don't think they did enough with it yet. They did too much and not enough. Right. You know what I mean? It's like that they should not have had the Skeet Ulrich flashbacks. They're completely takes me out of the movie every time he's on screen because he just wearing bad makeup. Look at what the, if you're spending money to make a screen movie and they can spend it now that they've like made more than any other one on opening. They could spend that money and make get the guys who did the Marvel de-aging of like Michael Douglas. You know what I mean? And the Ant-Man movies. But she doesn't even need him talking to her. You know, it's, she never met him. She doesn't know who he is. So it's, it's almost more effective. It's if she's just giving a look or you can just tell, I think that would have been a better way to go. You're hundred percent right. They did too much and not enough at the same time. That's a great way of putting it. I all right. I think it's. I think. I think we've belabored the point. <laughs> Sean's ready for bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to talk about the next movie. Actually, <laughs> all right. Our undisputed classic is "When a Stranger Calls."
What a Stranger Calls, uh, 1978, is that right, Jeff? I think so, yeah. Uh, starring uh, Carol Kane, at least in the early portion, and also Charles Durning. Uh, it tells the story of a woman who's babysitting a couple of kids, uh, and she gets these weird phone calls and, uh, and tells her to check on the kids. And uh, then they find out that the two kids have been brutally murdered. Uh, then they cut to a few years later, and that guy has escaped from a mental asylum and is out again. And Charles Durning is trying to find him on behalf of the family of the, the dead kids. This movie's awesome. I, I don't know why I've never seen this before. I loved this. And I read some reviews of this that weren't good. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This movie's excellent. That opening sequence is fantastic. The, just every every choice they make. The, the, the clever choices of lighting. The clever choices of setting. Uh, the phone calls. The, the dialogue is terrific. Have you checked the children is chilling. It's chilling. It's so good. And then the call is coming from inside the house is iconic. You know, everybody knows that one. Uh, then, you know, the, but Carol Kane is so, so wonderful and so innocent and sweet and like just the perfect character to put in a situation like this. Then this the middle portion, a lot of people really hate the middle portion of this. I loved it. I loved what they were setting up with there. I thought the character, uh, Duncan, the, the, the bad guy, was really compelling. Duncan, yeah. Like he's a creep, and I wanted him to die. I love it. That's the thing. It's like it's really forcing you into a very difficult moral quandary because I don't want to. I'm certainly not going to kill anybody, but at the same time, I always have that thought about like if I know somebody is guilty, like I can't feel that bad that they die. But like at the same time, I'm not somebody who supports the death penalty, you know. But I only don't support the death penalty because they get it wrong so often. They can't necessarily prove somebody is guilty sometimes, you know. But when somebody is actually yeah. guilty of a crime, when you know they did it, I don't have a problem. It, it, it definitely compromises my morality in many ways. And that's what that's this movie really kind of sticking it to me on that with the idea that Charles Durning has been hired to find this guy. But he's also decided he's going to kill this man when he finds him. And I, I loved the dynamic of that. But then you take it back to Carol Kane uh, and you take the killer back to her and in a way that was relatively believable. Uh and and that final sequence is awesome. It is such a great thing. I leapt out of my chair at that at that moment when he he says in the movie, "You can't see me." And I'm just like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. First of all, I did make a joke, Bob. I did my head go, "Oh, John Cena." Yeah, I could I couldn't resist, but like, yeah, I totally jumped at that point. And then another great reveal immediately following that. Just phenomenal. What a great movie. I, I I liked it a lot too, but it's the opening is so strong and it never gets back to that level of good. So that was kind of where it's fair. It's fair. Uh, and I was, I mean, I watched seven movies this weekend, <laughs> uh, which is unheard of for me. Uh, so I was a little bit exhausted too, but that was definitely the peak. You know that that opening sequence is amazing, uh, and. I think more just out of exhaustion. I had a hard time staying with it after that. Jeff? The opening 20 minutes of this movie is in the top five openings of any horror. At the top five anything in any horror movie. Um, you know, they take the conceit of from Black Christmas of the caller is coming. The calls are coming from inside the house. Um which I didn't realize until after, you know, I saw this first mm -hmm. and then I saw Black Christmas. I was like, oh, they totally ripped that off. Yeah, like, they ripped it <laughs> off from the best movie. So that opening 20 minutes is just it holds. It's the best opening of almost any other movie. Um, just the that tension and, you know, Carol Kane, I think she was like 25 or something when she did this, but she was so believable as a you know a babysitter home alone watching quote unquote these kids um i i do think that you know the movie loses you a little bit in the middle with the kurt duncan stuff because he's now keep in mind that the actor who played him um whose name is escaping me right now uh he was dying of cancer when they made this movie oh wow yeah, uh, so Tony Beckley is his name. Uh, he was dying of cancer. He died shortly after completing this movie. Hey. Um, so that, to me, you know, that kind of 
tells you a little uh, about his performance and why it's he's always so pained and you you, you kind of think it's because he's he wants to do this again and he's going to do this again uh, Carol Kane though just she just God she's so good even if, you know at the end when she she knows that he's coming back she kn- mm-hmm. she knows like Laurie Strode knew that Michael was gonna come back but she's dealt with it a little better I, I also I don't think that the timeline completely adds up that she would have kids as old as they are by the end of it if he's only you know it's only been five years but <laughs> you cut you go with it just because the story is so good i thought it was um, seven years but yeah oh uh, i mean even still like if she was 15 she's 22 and she's got six-year-olds or four-year-olds it was the 70s uh, she, <laughs> well i mean well and she she was gonna drink as a baby you know as the babysitter, so. <laughs> she did she, she did drink. this is true this is true um <laughs> you know she didn't give a shit about the kids she didn't go upstairs uh <laughs> Uh, Colleen Dewhurst too. I want to shout her out because she was so good. Yeah, she it. really. She's a, such a highlight of that middle portion, and uh, yeah, that I. Let's. This is one of those movies that like makes you yell at the screen, like, "Why the fuck did you leave your door open? What are you doing?" <laughs> you know, that yeah, kind of stuff. yeah. I yelled at the screen a lot during this movie, which I love to do. I love it when a movie can draw me in like that, and this one most certainly did. But she shout was great. out to my friend she, Ritanya Alda also for playing Mrs. Mandrakis at the end. <laughs> or at the beginning. That's cool. Uh, the uh, I just yeah her her middle portion there when she's when she's kind of being the bait and and uh, I, the bar sequence I thought was really good. Just a really solid thing where it's like that's so modern actually feeling too like so relevant yeah. today where a creep just won't leave you alone. Uh, it, it that that felt uh, that felt visceral. I felt I felt her disgust in a way that was really real. And such a good piece of casting because everybody's temp. Anybody in this, anybody today would be tempted to cast a young actress, and casting her was so so, so much more you know, of the of that setting. Like Torchies is where she is. Like that's you know that's exactly the bar where she is. Absolutely, loved that. Yeah, just such a good movie. Just like everything about it. I mean, even even when it is slower in the in the middle, it's for a reason. You know, you, this couldn't be about Carol. This couldn't be like an hour and a half of just her getting the phone calls. Yeah. There's no way. If and I've when, got... When, go ahead. When she opens that door and, you know, she sees the the shadow up there and she opens the door and you think she's going to get away and then all of a sudden it's Charles Durning and you scream because you think he's the killer. <laughs> and that That's just perfection. Yeah. I, 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 I was blown away. I... I legit like i think i just love this movie now i do i do anything else on a stranger call or when a stranger calls before we get to 93 don't watch yep. the sequel <laughs> yeah when a stranger oh, calls back. Uh, i was hope i've got we were watching that one next year <laughs> well go ahead and you guys can it. do it for the for the 30 year <laughs> we're definitely doing it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this week you went with Fire in the Sky over CB4 in a far off place. Yes, uh, Fire in the Sky is uh, supposedly, allegedly, ridiculously supposed to be the most uh, the most believable story about an alien abduction. It's not particularly believable. Even the movie itself is kind of throwing shade at its own story by including like, oh, well, they had a tabloid you know, in the truck that shows somebody getting paid to, to come up with an alien abduction story. Uh, like it, even the movie is critiquing itself, but it's it's a very sloppy film. Uh, it, from in terms of just the the casting, the dialogue, uh, the 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 choices of uh, of scene settings, like it's all very sloppy in terms of its choices. Uh, the one thing you're going to hear on the podcast though is just Amy is just obsessed with Robert Patrick. Like <laughs> Robert Patrick apparently is super hot in this movie, <laughs> which I, okay. If you, it, you, it definitely reveals something about Amy on the show. So that was fun. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I didn't care for it. I don't think it's very good. I do have to say the alien abduction sequence is strong. Like in terms of just how, how gross it is, the grossness of it and the, uh, the, the torture elements that they choose are good, but everything else, Listen to the show, though. We had a lot of fun, and it's a very funny episode. It terrified me when I was 12. 
<laughs> the alien abduction sequence, I bet, yes. The oh, rest yeah. of it, you were really bored as shit. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> is Jurgen Prock now in this one? He should be, but I don't think he is. Uh, we, we were looking for him because he's in every movie and he's a superstar. Uh, next week, we got Shazam 2, Boston Strangler on Hulu. And we're doing that as a classic as well. Is that correct? Yeah, the Boston Strangler 1968 starring uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's dad. And then in 93, we got Point of No Return and Ninja Turtles 3. I'm assuming you're doing Point of No Return. No, we're going to do oh. Ninja Turtles 3. <laughs> Why? You're going to be disappointed unless you've already done it. <laughs> no, we haven't, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it. Nothing's going to top watching that first Ninja Turtle movie. Nothing's going to top that. But this could I think Secret that. of the U. Secret of the U just kind of you know dragged me down to a level where I can't be too disappointed. Yeah, you know? this is worse than that. <laughs> this is like like a lot. Worse but it's a, it, it, it's like we peaked and it was kind of on a slow decline. So I mean, uh, I'm okay. I think I'll be all right. It's not a slow <laughs> decline after this one. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about uh, Point of No Return here because that movie gave me my love of Nina Simone. Yeah, I love that movie when that came out. All right. Uh, real quick, you want to run a movie through flick chart so we don't stay up all night? Sure, sure. What do you want to run? How about through? when a stranger calls? Let's do it. Yeah, that's a good one. We should start running our classic through. We used to do that, and we just got away oh, from yeah. it. Very quickly, while we're setting this up, Jeff, what did you think of the remake of When a Stranger Calls? Um, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't, you know, they tried to stretch the first 20 minutes into a whole movie, though. Yeah. And doesn't, with doesn't technology, work with cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only the only one that kind of now looking back on it, because when they when they remade Black Christmas in 2006, I was like, you can't do that with cell phones. <laughs> but looking back on it, I'm like, oh, they kind of could, you know, yeah. better than the 2019 remake. Um. So there's a way to do it. I just think that the Black Christmas remake did it better than When a Stranger Calls remake. When a Stranger Calls, Tango and Cash. When a Stranger Calls. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. When a Stranger Calls, The Princess Diaries. When a Stranger Calls. When a Stranger Calls. <laughs> <laughs> when a Stranger Calls, Bottle Rocket. When a Stranger Calls. Yep. When a stranger calls, the usual suspects. When a stranger calls. Yep. If it hadn't had Kevin Spacey in it, it would have been a little tougher. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, agree. With a, or directed by I, Brian Singer. That's that's Ke- that's <laughs> Ke- that's Nicolas Cage. What are you talking about? Oh, All right. oh then I picked the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> when a stranger calls, Rocky. Rocky. When a stranger calls, because I know what Bob's picking. <laughs> When a Stranger oh. Calls Hereditary. 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 Another movie, though, that as much as I love Hereditary, it never lives up to that first, you know, that murder, uh, that car scene, the beheading. That's mm-hmm. definitely the peak. Or the maybe the next day in the school. I don't know. That was... Anyway, When a Stranger yeah. Calls, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Who Framed Roger Rabbit? When a Stranger Calls. Roger Rabbit. When a stranger calls, that thing you do. When a stranger, a stranger calls. What's that thing you do for me? When a stranger calls, the big sleep. Oh, mm. the big sleep. Yeah, I mean, as a whole, <laughs> yes. When a stranger calls, the rear window. Rear window. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say for a window. I agree with that. When a stranger calls, Amos Peros. When a stranger calls. Yeah, when a stranger calls. I'll go with the dog movie. 154 between Amos Peros and the rear window. <laughs> what have we got in this area? Monster, Harry Potter. What a random um, bunch yeah. of movies. Yeah, <laughs> very. Yeah, this will be fun to take our classics through. And then you're right, we should do a 
maybe a couple bonus episodes where we just grab random movies and run them through. All right. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, looking through it, like make a make a note every time we see one that we think should be higher. Well, last week, like I think like Alien should list. be higher than one forty nine. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, No Country for Old Men, I think, should be higher. Yeah. Rear window should be higher. We think that, but like, and then you get to the top, and it's like, oh wait, no, we've got, we don't have that much room. <laughs> That's true. Hundred is not that many movies. Yeah. All right. I will see you. Talk to you guys next week. Cool. Shazam. <laughs> <laughs>